Bezat Hashem, in the merit of the two powerful to live, we say, and in the merit of the, all the Torah we're going to learn for the next 60 minutes, and in the merit of the Tehillim, we're going to say at the end of it, Hashem should give Shmirah, should give guarding, the angel Gabriel should come and help us win the war right now, this should be very fast, the Shuv Hashem Keref Ayin, the whole land of Israel should be protected, every single soul should be protected, these God, there should be shalom, peace very, very, very soon. And Bezat Hashem, Hashem should help us win this war quickly. Bezat Hashem. So we're going to look in there to Kumash because amazingly, what's happening in the world is happening in this week's Pasha. So when I thought about doing the talk this week, and I started opening up the parasha, I couldn't see what I was, couldn't believe what I was seeing. All right, so let's begin. If any of you have got Facebook, if you could just share, just press share. We've got on Facebook Live just now. It's a big talk, it's a really important one. Could be the most important class. Of... This isn't a merit, this is, this is a responsibility to give. It's very much about what Kabbalah says about this war, what will happen, what, what's happening in the spiritual world. You know, I'm not a soldier, I'm not a politician, I'm a rabbi, and I study Kabbalah. And one of the first lessons in Kabbalah is everything that happens in reality is caused from a spiritual reality. Everything. In fact, there is no reality other than a spiritual reality. And therefore, if you want to understand the physical world, you've got to look at the DNA. You've got to look at the coding. We look at the Torah. So if you want to understand what's happening in front of our eyes right now, I mean, as, as, as you said, why is it that normally when you have a news story of 1,400 people have been killed and there's been babies that have been taken hostages and, and babies decapitated, no one would ever dream of saying, prove it. I need to see it with my own eyes. All of a sudden, if it's to the Jews, you don't believe it. Be'emet, and by the way, don't be frustrated. Because you just had expectations that you thought we're treated the way everyone's treated. But we're not. We've never been. We never will be. That's part of what it means to be part of the Jewish people. As famously, I think, Elie Wiesel said in the Holocaust, Hashem, this is what it means to be the chosen people. Go and choose someone else. He didn't mean it. He was rhetorical. But what comes with being the chosen people? Tragically, for us, is anti-Semitism. From the very beginning, it makes zero sense. It was Jordan Peterson's great line about it. It's a canary, a canary in a coal mine, he called it. It's an impossibility. It's an oxymoron. It's this limited, tiny, tiny nation that is behind everything. And as Lloyd George says, the old Prime Minister of England, when we have no money, we're victimized for being miserly with money. And when we're super rich, we're also victimized for being beggars. In Shylock, you can't, it's opposite. When we don't have a home, we're told, get out of our home. And when we do have a home, why should you have a home? We can never win. And guess what? We should stop trying to win. And we're not going to win the PR war. But there is a very important spiritual war we need to win, which is what we're going to hear learn tonight. You have to understand, you know, people are saying, October the 7th, you need context. That lovely word, or what that evil man says, nothing happens in a vacuum. The truth is they're right. It's just not the context and vacuum that they're referring to. We're tonight going to learn about the context and vacuum. We're going to learn about the bigger picture, the macro picture, where it really all began, what's really happening. We're just kind of the last few moves on the chessboard. But I want to take you, if it's okay with you, in the next 60 minutes on a quick rewind of 6,000 years of your spiritual reality to explain what's happening now and what will be happening within the context and show it's all in this Torah, it's all here, 
Everything's here. Number two, if anybody's watching this, and I've got a lot of friends on, on YouTube and on Instagram that are going to be watching tonight. Nice to see you. Please share. This is a very, obviously, politically sensitive topic. A lot of my non-Jewish friends are watching tonight. A lot of my Arab friends that are watching tonight. When we're going to be talking about the war with Ishmael, the Ishmaelite exile, when I use the phrase from now on over the next 60 minutes, Yishmael, it does not refer to every Arab and every Muslim. On the contrary, the majority of Arabs and the majority of Muslims, please God, are very peaceful, loving, wonderful people. And, and we can't wait to live in peace and harmony with, with, with our cousins that want to live with us. In fact, I've, many of you have probably got friends who are Arabs. You know, one of the, my new best friends in Tel Aviv is my neighbor Ashraf that's being super nice to me. And a lot of our alcohol that we have here is from Ashraf, and Ashraf's a good man, and, and we're mates, and, and he's one of the good ones. So we're not talking about, Judaism isn't allowed to be racist. We're not, we're not, this war should not, God forbid, make us racist. That's not going to help. It's not going to help. It's not going to help to say I hate everyone. It's not going to help. What's going to help is really to find who the enemy is, who the enemy was. And when we use the, 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 the term Yishmael, it does not refer, as I said, to the majority of Arabs and Muslims. It's referring specifically to any of you watching that want to kill me and want to kill my people. It's referring to you. It's referring to the Ishmaels that want to hate us. I just listened to one of the Hamas leaders. It's funny. It was on Twitter. One of the guys said, He's really bad at PR. I think he's awesome at PR. At least he's telling the truth. He just went out there just now in Saudi Arabia and said, what we did on October the 7th, we want to do again and again and again until there's no Israel. Baruch Hashem, at least he's telling the truth. The stupidity of the world is they don't realize that's what they really believe. And I've got news, there's a lot of people not within Hamas that also believe that. And you just got to call a spade a spade and be that's why a ceasefire now means we need to cease fire, and others will try and still kill us, so the answer is not a ceasefire. Here we go. What is the Ishmaelite exile? What's going to happen? What's happening at the moment? It's very intense to be able to give this class in Israel during the war. Normally I give this class objectively. When you're going through it, it's been, even just to prepare it, the past few days I've been hard. By the way, if anybody is triggered by certain of the traumatic things that are happening, probably you shouldn't be listening to this class. Normally it's the rabbi. Everyone listen, everyone listen. I think one of the only times I'm going to say, if you're triggered by going through some of the intensity and the trauma of some of the details, maybe don't listen right now. Maybe like turn off and wait for the war to be over and then watch it. Because I only want to make you feel good and I only want to make you feel positive and I only want to help you feel closer to who you really are and to Hashem. So if you're not ready for certain details probably turn off now and then turn it back a bit later. But for those who, who are ready to deal and tackle with some of the big topics, let, let's go for it. Here we go. The story begins, my friends. Nothing happens in the physical world if it's not in the Torah. It's not a coincidence. So what happens in the current physical world is what we're reading in the Torah at that time. This could have been during Leviticus. You know, if this would have happened, in about six months' time, we get a learning about sacrifices or, or the temple or Cohen's. But guess what? This war's happening. Guess who's just been born? Yishmael and Abraham. This is the story of the Jews and Yishmael. And how does it begin? So for those of you who want to take notes, and especially some at home are taking notes, it's very important chapter and verse that you don't trust the word I say and just... Check it out for yourself. So first of all, chapter, this is my journalist friend says, you've got to give our sources, otherwise no one believes. So I feel you. Chapter 16, verse 11 is the first place to check. That's where one of the only six people in the whole of the universe that was named by Hashem was Yishmael. Normally, a parent names a child. I'm assuming most of you were named by your parents. 
And the Talmud says, that's one of the only times you get a 60th of prophecy. Hashem put into my parents' head to call me Abraham. My name is Avi, which is short for Abraham, and I live a life trying to follow the ethos and journey of Abraham. Just recently, I've taken on the ordeal of leaving my family behind and leaving London behind and coming into Israel, which was one of the ordeals of Abraham. And your name really defines who you are, but your parents normally choose your name through prophecy from Hashem. Six times, Hashem himself named the person. Yishmael was one of those. It says in the Torah, chapter 16, 11, Malach Hashem, saying to Hagar, the Karata Shema Yishmael. You should call him Yishmael. Now, you have to understand something. If any of you are encoding, I think Jonathan, you said there you're into video games. I'm sure the way video games work is when you're playing the game, what's going on on the screen is only happening on the screen because you made a program. <laughs> and really, it's all happening within the program. My friends, your name is the program. Yishmael. Who can tell me what does Yishmael mean? No. What's the root of Yishmael? Huh? Right. Shema. Shema Yisrael. Shema. To listen. To hear. So what is Yishmael? So, very good. It means Hashem will hear. Hashem will hear. Our Arab friends are called Hashem will hear. So ostensibly, it's Hashem says, Ki shama Hashem You cried, Hagar, you wanted a child. I'm giving you what you want. Here we go, Bible code number one. Are you, are you ready for this? Write this down. This is like Bible code number one. Written by, his name was Rabbi Eleazar ben Horkinus. He was the rabbi of Rabbi Akiva. This was written one, uh, 2,000 years ago, approximately. 1,900 years ago. By the way, before Muhammad. Just to get our quick history. If we know our macro history, Abraham was born 3,800 years ago. We're now in the Hebrew year. What's the Hebrew year we're in? One here is five, seven, eight. Four, right? We're in 5784. Abraham is born in the year 1948, which is a bit interesting for the state of Israel. Right, he's born in the year 1948. So 3,800 years ago is where the Jewish journey began. About 2,000 years after that, sorry, what, um, one, um, how long after that was Christianity? Two and a half thousand years after that was Christianity, right? About during the Second Temple time. And then, 2,000 years after that was, was Christianity, and then 600 years after that was, was Islam, was Muhammad, was the Quran. So Pirkei Drebeleza was written even before Christianity, like at the beginning of Christianity, 600 years before Islam. So what did Pirkei Drebeleza say? And this is one of the big Bible codes. He's the one, first and foremost, that we see in chapter 30, if you're going to take notes, don't believe a word I say, chapter 30, Pirkei Drebeleza, he says, my dear friends, Jewish people, you're going to be going through in your life four exiles. We had four exiles. We had exile of Egypt. We had an exile in Babylon, the 70 years between the first and second temple. We had an exile, the Greek exile, during the Hanukkah story. And when the Romans threw us out on the second temple, that was called the Galut Edom. He writes, it's going to be one at the end, the end of days, which is going to be way worse, way more brutal, way more intense. And that's why Hashem called him Yishmael. Because they're going to make us cry. And they're going to make us weep. And they're going to make us cry out to Hashem. And do you know why they're called Yishmael? Because Hashem is going to listen to our cry. I had a friend of mine two nights ago. He's at the Western Wall. He goes, Avi, you're not going to believe this. I said, what? I said, there's this guy that's just come to the Western Wall, and he's been screaming at Hashem. And he screamed the following. He said, Hashem, thank you so, so much. He was miraculously release, releasing our hostage. What's the name of the young lady? 
are we, right? It's miracles. But my son's also a hostage. And Hashem, release him as well. He starts screaming at Hashem at the Western Wall a few nights ago. You've released one, you've shown you can do the miracle. You've got to release mine as well. And my friend went to open to him and he found out what was happening. They all started doubling for his friend, for his son. They're making us cry. And they're making us pray. And by the way, that is the way to win this war, ironically. Whenever it's making us up, and the fact that we started tonight with the Elim, Yishmael, said it. But then let's at least do it. And Hashem will listen to us and we're going to win. Every time we pray, we get closer to victory. That's exactly what their name, and remember, Yishmael means Hashem will listen to us. So the Torah says, Yishmael, Hashem will listen. Oh, yeah, yeah. Even then, it says something the following. Bible code number two. This is all. How much time named Ishmael? He says, You can have a son, Ishmael, but for who ye he Pere Adam. It's the only time in the Torah that Hashem has said such a strange depiction of a human. A Pere Adam. Maze pere adam. Pere means wild. Pere means inhumane. Pere means brutal. Pere means insane. They're going to be pere adam. And again, as I said at the beginning, this does not refer, this does not refer to most of our Arab and Muslim friends. It's referring to a very distinct segment of those who hate Jewish people and want to kill everyone. Anyone who shares that is the Pera Adam. Anyone who thinks, okay, what Hamas did, that's Pera Adam. How people could be demonstrating right now in favor of what Hamas has done, that's insane. You know, the, 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 this Arab-Israeli conflict is complicated. We know it's complicated. But what Hamas did should not be complicated. It was so evil, it's so beyond the pale, that anyone who supports them, you have to say there's something very, very troubling behind so many people getting behind the death. Why is it the left-wing position is favoring, and, and they're saying, you know, we're not really favoring Hamas. They're not that upset. It's like, I think in England, let's come back to this lovely, Beautiful Western country where last night Liverpool Street Station was taken by, by pro Palestinians, which was screaming death to the Jews and, and singing from the river to the sea. And on the night of Simchat Torah, when we hadn't even done anything yet, they were on the street. What are you protesting about? The fact that we're going to fight back? Or are you protesting about the fact we're alive? Says this Bible code number two. His name is Rebchaim Vital. He's a student of Darya Kadosh. The book called The Etz Hadat Tov. You're looking up the source. He says prophecy, my mass prophecy. Rebchaim Vital had a tradition from the Arya Kadosh, who we all know could see the future. He was Rebchaim Kadosh. He was one of those who would go to graves and would know. Oh, that's not the right soul in the grave. He saw soul, the Ariakados. Like many Kabbalists, he could see what's going to be happening in 2023 on Simchat Torah. Says Rupai Vital, what they're going to do in this war is going to be so much worse than anyone else. You're right, there's going to be a terrible thing will happen with Edom. But what they'll do will be worse, which anyone would have thought that the Nazis could be topped. You couldn't make it up. But some of the stuff that they've been think I mean, the fact that they were able to sit down and have a meal, they took our Shabbos food, our Simchas Torah food, and, and, and mutilated children in front of parents 
and parents in front of children at the same time had the chutzpah to be eating our Shabbos food and then put the baby in the oven and then put it on, on selfies. This is, not, this is not normal. Even for a psychopath, this is a whole different level. Guess why? Because the para Adam. Let me explain. In Hebrew, you put the noun first and then the adjective afterwards. So, a wild man should be called Adam Pere, like you say, a great man of Adam Gadol. Shulchan Gadol. You don't say Gadol Shulchan. So, Rabbi Yeshua Leib Diskin, called the Maharal of Diskin, born in 1818, writes, that the fact that Hashem first of all calls them Pere, and then Adam, means at their essence, they're really inhumane. In other words, the, the, the scum terrorist that did this is because there isn't much humanity there. The first and foremost wild, there's a bit of humanity. And that's why we can't negotiate. Why do you think we haven't been able to come up with a two-state solution? It's not just being the Jews' fault. <laughs> now we see what Hamas wants, and it's not just Hamas. How can you negotiate? They don't want two states. They don't want one Jew anywhere in the world. If there's one Jew in a beach in Vietnam, they'll find him or her. They want zero Jews. Per, through Pere Adam. <coughs> because they're, and that's why you can't talk to them. That's why this war is not going to... You know, let's say you, some of us, and we're so nice to Jewish people. We think I was, we were talking yesterday. We just want to make things better. We want to talk. We want to be, we think we can like talk. There's a time for talking. And, 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 and if one of us, you know, can you imagine on some Simchat Torah, oh, come, let's talk about it. I'll cut your tongue off and then do something with it. There's nothing to talk about with certain people. You just got to just kill or be killed. And, and, and you have to understand something, Judaism, and, and this is the chance to say it. We believe in peace. We're a people of peace. We're a nation of peace. We're people that pray for peace every day. All of our core prayers conclude with peace. I never understood this until I saw it in the, in the Siva Shalom. The Amidah. What's the last blessing of the Amidah? Mavarek atamo Yisrael bashalom. What is the last part of grace after meals? Hashem Yivarek atamo bashalom. What is the end of Kadesh? Of Kadesh. Oseh shalom bin Romav. All our prayers we conclude with peace. Why? Says the Nesiva Shalom because peace isn't just another request. It's everything. It's the vessel which contains everything. All we want is peace. You can't be happy at home. You can't be happy at work. Right now, the whole world, we are, we feel we're on pause. It's like COVID again. Can't make plans. Don't know what's going on. There's no peace. There's no peace. You don't get anything. We need peace. We want peace. We crave peace. We want peace with everyone. But you've got to make peace with someone who wants to make peace with you. And if they want to kill you, there's Allah. You've got to kill them first. End of. You can be a peace lover, but unfortunately have to kill. By the way, it's another huge difference between the Jewish people and, and Yishmael in this context. If you hear the news that one of the Hamas terrorists died, you shouldn't start celebrating. You shouldn't start being jubilant. We don't rejoice in the downfall of our enemies. Let the other side do that. We're, okay. Baruch Hashem, one less. We don't celebrate. We celebrate when and miraculously a hostage comes home. We celebrate life. We don't celebrate death. Even death is someone that wants to kill us. We say shame that has to happen. Everyone is Hashem's handiwork. At the end of the day, when, when, we, when the Egyptians came and were drowned in the sea, and the angels wanted to sing, Hashem said, don't sing. Even the Egyptians, they're my people. I've got a soul. Part of my breath is in them too. You know, they might be Pere, but they're still a bit of Adam. It's got a Hashem in everyone. And never, shame has come to this. Tragic has come to this. And you can feel a lot of empathy and pain for what's happening in Gaza. There's no contradiction to say, we don't want thousands of people to die. You don't want that. We can say that. And at the same time, say, we want all those that hate me and want to kill me to die. It's not a contradiction. 
It's not a contradiction. So, so far we've learned the fact that Hashem says Yishmael means because we're going to cry. The fact that the Kupere Adam means crazy insanity is going to happen. Then let's come to our to our pasuk in this week's Ezra. So what happens in this week, this week, we're reading right, right now, huge fight between Ishmael and Abraham and Isaac. You see, Abraham, for those who don't know quick the story, he marries this Egyptian handmaid called Hagar. They have Ishmael. His soulmate Sarah, Hashem didn't let them have a child for a long, long, long time. Finally, this week, Isaac's born. So you can understand how Ishmael feels when Isaac's there. What's going? The war right now is not a political war. It's not about land. It's a religious war. You have to understand that to understand what's really going on. It started, that started this week in the Torah, where, you, where Yishmael said, I'm the firstborn, not you. I'm the real son of Abraham, not you. In the Quran, they changed the verse of this week's parasha, which talks about the Akhidah. And Hashem says to Yitzchak, the son that you love, I want you to bound him for me and take him up to the mount, the Temple Mount. It's all about the Temple Mount. It really is. And it happened this week. When Hashem told Abraham to take Yitzchak and prove your love for me. And what do they say in the Quran? And I wrote it down because you might not believe me. Dum, dum, dum. Where is it? I found the chapter and verse there as well. I'll tell you later. 31 something. Where it says Ishmael instead of Isaac. They just changed where it says Isaac to Ishmael. Because their whole thing is they're the chosen, chosen people. And that whole idea of suicide bombing. That, that we're prepared to give up our life for Hashem. Even though it was us, they pretend it was them. And even though Hashem promised us the land, they pretend it was them. And even though the holiest place of all is even in the Torah to the Jewish people, they say it's to them. And you have to understand something. This Bible code goes on to say in Pilkater of Eleza, crazy thing, you ready for this? Crazy. Again, how does he know he can see into the future? 1,900 years it's written. And this is before Muhammad. There's going to be a time where Yishmael are going to build a very big object, he calls it, on our Kodesh Kodashim. He writes that. And it's all going to be about that. And watch this. There's a famous piece of Talmud where during the Romans, Rabbi Akiva and his Friends see the sight of foxes running in and out of the temple. Now, Shualim Halkuba. You know that? Shualim Halkuba. Foxes are running in and out. And they're all crying. Rabbi Kiva's laughing. He says, Why are you crying? Because there's a verse in Safari that says, One day there'll be Shualim. There'll be foxes running in and out. Shualim. Shualim. It's an acronym for Yishmael. It was a prediction. Yishmael, hal They're called the Pere Adam. Animals, foxes. The Rabbi Akiva could see the foxes on that point. He could see that it wasn't actually the Romans. It's going to be the end of day problem. The real end of days, the real final catalyst to bring Mashiach will be this final battle, this final encounter between us and Yishmael. It was always us and Yishmael. Esau was like the order, it was the prelude. This was the final battle. Abraham's son. Esau's the grandson, after all. This is at the root, the final battle, which all the mystics predicted. And they predicted about the, what they were going to build. Why do you think Hamas and the lights got so excited every time, you know, Ben Gvir goes and walks on Temple Mount? Is it We walk on it, not you. That's our place. They understand the spiritual tension. So what happens? Let me explain to you. What's one of the problems? What has Yishmael got over us that we don't have? What is the mitzvah they do that maybe you could argue they do better than us? Anyone know? What's one of the 613 mitzvah that they do? Famous one. They have circumcision. 
They do circumcision. And do you know when they do circumcision? Bar mitzvah. 13 years. Ishmael had to do it 13 years. We do it at eight days old. Let me ask you, what's more of a spiritual proof of love of God? 13 years old? By the way, or if Hashem, Hashem, you didn't ask me to do it at 13. It wouldn't have been a, a nice bar mitzvah, right? So, you mentioned Jewish people, it's like, no way. <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's gonna, we're like, forget about it. It doesn't work for the Jews. Like, it has to be done at eight days because we can't say no at that point. But then you could argue, so it's no big deal. And this is a very important debate now. Watch this. Here we go. Let's go deep. Let's go Kabbalistically. This is my bash, the issue. Yes, Yishmael have a brit milan. That's what's giving them a lot of strength, unfortunately. By the way, the Pasuk in this week, Sedra, says, let's see if I can find it. By Yehra. You have to literally you have to look at it to believe your eyes. Unbelievable. 2119. Chapter 21, verse 19, if you're taking notes. Check out 2119. 2119. It says 2020. Shem says. They're going to have a hand in everything, and everyone's going to have a hand in them, and then they're going to be in the world. Shem gives them a, a bracha. By the way, in, I found it in, in, in the Quran. It was chapter 37 in Surah, verse 99 to 111. It's their definition of the Akedah, where they change the words. Where they change the words. For us, 21, 9, chapter 21, verse 9, where Hashem promises them that they're going to have a hand in everything, which is, which is really interesting. What's going on in the world, what's going on in the oil in the world, very much connected to this pasuk. But here's where it goes. Brit Mila, you choose it or it happens to you. Let me explain. When Hashem went to Ishmael, before the Jews, and said, you want the Torah, what did he say? He said, what does it say in the Torah, Hashem? Makasivbe. And Hashem says, Lotignov, don't steal. What did Hashem say? Don't steal. Do you want the Torah? He said, it's not cut. We're not cut out for it. Let me explain. You might think that Yishmael has an advantage that they choose the Brit Milah. Mm-mm. Do you know what Brit means? It means a covenant. It means a contract. A contract is two ways. You can't sign a contract if someone hasn't signed it with you. Again, we're not the people that chose Hashem with the chosen people. The bracha I make every morning, Hashem, thank you very much. Asher, bachar, banu, you chose me. Now, just very, very important here. I want you to understand this. To be part of the Jewish people doesn't mean, God forbid, we're not better or worse, we're different. We have a different role to play. Let me explain something interesting, which my friend Jonathan Sachs used to explain. The end of days is so different if you're Jewish, if you're Christian, if you're Islam. Do you know why so many Christian evangelicals are really helping us right now and behind us right now? Because in their story, they need us to win this war. And then they think we're all going to convert to Christianity. Mm-mm, not going to happen. Sorry, guys. Because Christian view is we're right. And the only way to get close to God is to believe in you. JC, a nice Jewish boy. Here we go. In Islam, it's the same thing. They believe the only way to get close to God is to believe in the Quran and to believe in, in Allah, and you've got to convert or die. Which, by the way, that's how stupid the Western world is being by siding with people that want to cut your heads off. Starts with the Jews, but we're just the first stop on the tour of, of world taking over, you start being. They want everyone. You believe in them or you're dead. What's Judaism? Says Maimonides, says the Torah. Our end of days is very, very beautiful. Someone's going to say, hey, the Torah is amazing. Can I convert? We say, you really don't need to, actually. You're great. Hashem loves you. 
is Bruno Mars says, just the way you are, just the way you are. You're beautiful just the way you are. You don't have to become me. Shem doesn't want you to become me. He wants you to be you. Meaning, there's not one way to serve Hashem. There's many ways. Many ways. Yes, the common denominator is we're all going to say Hashem HaKadosh Marachat. We're all going to believe in the ethical monotheism that Abraham brought to the world. Nachon. There's Hashem, and Hashem's everywhere, and, and everyone will believe in one God. But then, someone who's not Jewish won't keep Shabbat, won't keep kosher. They don't need to. The Jewish people have got to do Shabbat kosher. And therefore, where Yishmael got it wrong is when you have an eight-day-year-old boy that Hashem has commanded, I love you, I want to marry you, you've got to be ready for me. You've got to refine yourself to be a vessel ready to receive the Torah. So you've got to be ready. A 13-year-old boy who then does bris milah has missed the whole point. He hasn't been ready and he hasn't been commanded. Yes, they have a merit. Achon. But there's nothing like the merit of Hashem say, I choose you and now ready yourself. And that's what the Brit Milah does. Let's go even deeper. Where Reb Chaim Vital says that King David knew about this war, he has a few proofs. One of them is on, on Tehillim number 55. In fact, that's where Hashem says, Yishma Kel. King David uses Yishma El. And if you're going to take notes, you need to see it with your own eyes. Unbelievable. It's Tehillim 55. Number 20. You can turn to page 80. That's where God says, Hashem, I will listen to your cry. And then he says, Asher ein chalifot lamo. Now, it's interesting. Whenever I go on an aeroplane, whoever I sit next to, there's always like a story. So I flew two nights ago. I was like, what's the story going to be? And what was interesting is, Hashem put it into my head to say to... Uh, when I was checking in, mm, can you like, is there any better seats? Even though I had an aisle seat and I wasn't going to pay more, I was like, if there's any better seats, I'm happy to move. Anyway, I got there and they give me a new boarding ticket and they moved me next to a big cabalist. And we spent the whole flight getting ready for this talk. He was, he's doing the same talk tomorrow night and we, we, were, we were swapping notes and we were helping each other. So he showed me this. This is thank you for this. Asher ein chalifot lamo. The word chalifot is an interesting word in the Pasuk King David writes. Khalifa means, on one hand, King David saying the journey, but it's referring to, what do we say, litchalef? To change. Yishmael doesn't change. Let's explain. Yishmael's vision is, this is the view, we do this, we just do this, we'll die for you. We'll just, whatever you want, we'll do it for you. The Jewish people, I mean, by the way, let's just, let's just get something straight for a minute. What would you say, if me as the rabbi would be saying, like, okay, the way you're going to get close to God is let's put a suicide bomb on you. And, and, and you just go into some place and then blow yourself up. I tell you what, if I was in your seat, I'd be saying, you go first, rabbi. You know, which Jew would, would let someone brainwash them and, and, and get them to do something that they weren't doing. I mean, by the way, the whole concept, right, of the leader of Hamas is right now in a seven-star hotel in Qatar is just beyond belief, right? Which, you know, all his crew is in the tunnel now in Gaza, and he's chilling out in a jacuzzi. Are you having a laugh? Like, which Jewish people would fall for that nonsense, right? But they do because they have such blind faith without thinking. One of our ways to spiritually grow is the notion of change. My friends, over the coming days and weeks, our job is just to keep changing, keep getting better, keep growing. It's never good enough. It's never enough. You've got, you've got, better, you've got blessings, you've got quality, great. Now we can do better. Now we can do better. Do you, do you know how I feel right now? Invigorated. Empowered. I feel a bit like I did when I'm, I lost my father. When I lost my father, I felt I have to now learn harder, pray more for him. And I feel the same right now. I think Ellie's feeling the same, right? 
the feeling right now emboldened because I'm not praying for me now. I'm praying for the thousands of soldiers that need our prayers. I'm not doing a mitzvah just for me and God. Who knows if the mitzvah can change your life? The word pere adam, every letter, every word is everything. Kabbalists explain the following. When you do a mitzvah, your name stays how it's, so my name, Abraham. When I'm doing what I'm meant to do, in heaven they call me Abraham. As soon as I start distorting myself from my root, they start jumbling about the name. They play left name games in heaven the whole time. In fact, the real truth is, the change of the letters of the name changes our actions. Go figure that. So let's do some net letter changes with their name, Pere. Let's put the Aleph in front of the Resh. My dear friends, do you know what we need to be to counter the Pere? It's to be Pe'er. Pe Aleph Resh. The Kabbalist showed me. Pe Aleph Resh means to be magical, to be wonderful, to have wonder, to have Tiferet, to have splendor. What's been really interesting in this war specifically, in the very beginning, I've never seen a war where so many of the soldiers just want to put on fill in. Fill in, fill in, fill in, fill in, fill in. I had a friend of mine that was on a plane in America after October the 7th. And he was sitting next to a father who was crying. He'd lost his son on October the 7th. And, and father was beside himself and he's thinking, what can I do? What can I do to help my son now in heaven? What is an extra mitzvah I can do? And just into his head, he's thinking, okay, right now on this flight, I'm going to see if anybody wants to put on spillin. And he starts going to a few people. Are you happy to put on spillin? No one's saying anything. And my friend said to him, tell them the reason why. So he went up to one of them and said, I lost my son in, in October the 7th. Can you put on spillin? Sure, I'll do it. And before, there was a queue of people on the flight putting on Stalin for his son to the extent, true, the captain heard about it. And he got the pilot to continue, the, his mate to continue. The, the pilot came out to put on Stalin. Mika Amcha Yisrael. Do you know why? Because Stalin is called Per. One of the names for Stalin is Per. It's magical, it's wondrous. Our way of winning this war now, if you're a guy, Stalin will really help. If you're a girl, Tiferet, beauty, splendor, spiritual growth, we'll speak about what we can do. But what's going to win the war is our spirituality, I have no, no doubt, it's a religious war. That gives us strength. The disunity we have in this country, before Simchat Torah, what happened in Tel Aviv and Yom Kippur wasn't good. We're fighting with each other on the holiest day of the year, in the holiest place in the world. We're making ourselves vulnerable. Baruch Hashem, there's unity. It just happened straight away. Within a few hours, there's unity, unity, unity. That's why, Leah, don't get caught up into politics. Don't think about politics now. Politics brings disunity. We just need to think love. We need to think unity. We need to just think positive about each other. We just can only think about the Kudatoba in each other. One last thing from the Torah, Esau, who, who was a big mystic himself, he marries Ishmael's daughter, whose name is Machla, chapter 28, verse 9, which all the Bible predictions predict that at the end of days, there will be a marriage between some of Esau and Ishmael and Esau. When you hear about Gog and Magog, I haven't got time tonight to go into the war of Gog and Magog, but it's connected to that marriage between Esav and Ishmael's daughter. That's why you're seeing more and more of the world right now, even though they did the most disgusting act. The majority of the world are with Hamas. Go figure that. But Esav wasn't stupid. He's like, just in case I can't beat them by myself, let's join forces. It's like Batman against two of the villains. Two villains joined together. Ishmael and, and Esav, let's at least try together and that was that, what that marriage was. Next, if you want to check out in the, in the Bible some of the predictions for the end of days, we haven't got time now, but you check out Ezekiel, chapter 38 and 39. It's all there, what's happening in this war. Zachariah, 
chapter 14, Daniel chapter 12. I do want to share one nice thing though from Ezekiel. Because why Rabbi Akiva laughed, he said, well, if the bad stuff's going to happen, that means the good stuff's going to happen. Yes, Ezekiel says there's going to be some pain right now. He said straight afterwards, Hashem showed him and he writes it, the third Bethlehem And he shows him the actual measurement of the third Bethlehem Do you know that? We know the measurements of the third Bethlehem We know it was bigger than the second and the first. It's going to be magnificent. And we just need to focus on the good news that's coming. The positivity, the unity in the world, the peace in the world, the harmony in the world, the spiritual joy in the world is coming. It's really, really coming. It's coming super soon. Don't worry about it. What's going to happen? 100% we win. 100% Beth Amidash is going to be built. The third Beth Amidash. As we're going to see soon, now there's, there's, there's a dual path. It can go one of two ways to get there. In other words, that's where we're going, but there's two options of how we get there, which now we'll look into. First thing we'll look into is the place in Sota. So the way the Bible works, you've got the Bible, it takes you to like the year 3600, and then you have the oral law. And the oral law is written initially by Rebekiva, Judah the Prince, and then the Talmud. So this is written, the Talmud in Sota, page 49. <coughs> Let me read you out what it says. Read this. Here are some of the events that have to happen before Mashiach. Number one. I'm just going to read that and see which you tell me what you think is relevant to today's day and age. You ready? In the period preceding Mashiach, insolence will increase, honor will wane, prices will spiral upwards. Interesting. About inflation. The vine will yield its fruit. The government will turn to heresy. That rebuke will be non-existent. You should watch what's going on in the UK today. Galilee will be destroyed. The Galilee will be destroyed and the Gavlan desolated. By the way, before I forget, there's a verse in Sophania, which is mind-blowing. Again, it's chapter 2, verse 4, where it says, Azza will become desolate. It says that. As will Ashkelon and Ashdod. Check out Stephania, chapter 2, verse 4. It's part of the moves before Mashiach. Azna will become desolate. What's going on in Gaza really is mamash part of, of the end of day stuff. And Stephania talks about it. Let's continue the, 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 the Talmud. The wisdom of the sages will um, deteriorate. Those who fear sin will be despised. Truth will be lacking. Youths will be put to elders to shame. The elderly will stand up for the young. The son will treat his father disgracefully. A daughter will rise up against his mother. A daughter-in-law against the mother-in-law, surely not. And a man's enemy will be members of his own household. The face of the generation will be like the face of a dog. Which, by the way, means that normally a leader should lead. The generation before Mashiach, the dog just follows what the leader says. In other words, the owner of the dog will be going here, the dog turns. The politicians will become like dogs, the Talmud says, meaning that they'll have no real principles themselves. They'll just do whatever's going to get them elected. A son, a son will have no shame before the father. And here's the point, says the Talmud, and this is now the next spiritual task for us to win this war. Are you ready? Everything, the chaos that's going to unfold, all will get you to get to the level where we say we can't rely on anyone other than you, Hashem. Let me share with you something. One of the downsides of the greatness of the Israeli army has been a lot of people have said they're infallible. They're the best. No one's better. We've got the Israeli army. We'll win. No one's better. They're the best. Experts. Well, best. Blah, 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 blah. What happened on October the 7th was so shocking on so many but where was the army? Eight hours? Better met? It normally takes eight hours to walk from one side of Israel to the other. How could it be eight hours for the army to get there? I haven't got the answer for you. Other than that, we now know that the only one that can really protect us is Hashem. We're under no illusions that if we've got the army, that's enough. It's not enough. 
they're nothing without Hashem. When King David beat Goliath, it was Hashem beating it. When we beat the Egyptians, it was Hashem beating the Egyptians. As we said in the, in the Shira, Hashem Ishmael Chama, Hashem Shema. Maybe one thing to come out of October the 7th is now we know that we are fallible and only with Hashem will we win. And it's really important to internalize that, which is, so therefore, Emunan Bitachon, my friends, is one of the most important spiritual jobs you need to do. Not just with the war. I think, it, I, think I don't know about you, my whole life's on pause right now. I don't know what's going on and where we are. We had a whole like financial kind of um, prospectus and pu- it's all gone. I haven't got a clue. People who would have given to JTRV and now want, want to give to the army war effort. We need Emuna in our lives more than ever. Maybe some of you were like, okay, this is the year I'm going to find my soulmate. All of a sudden everyone's fighting a battle. Who's got time for date? So, we're all in the same boat. Our whole lives are hitting the pause button. And now, more than ever, we need to say, Hashem, it's going to be okay, and I trust you. My friends, you know what's really going to help? When you pray, at the end of your prayer, you conclude your prayers by saying, Hashem, I trust you that we're going to win. I trust you it's going to be okay. I trust you that will be shalom. I'm putting my trust in you. The mystics say, when we say the line, I'm putting my trust in you, that sends down a big blessing to the world. A huge blessing. We need to say it. Like, you know, we, I do a lot of coaching. And in coaching, mantras are very important. Affirmations are important. We need to affirm our emunah. Don't just assume it. Hashem doesn't assume it. Assumptions don't work. You've got to say it. Articulate it. Hashem, I put my bitachon in you. Don't just say their cry. Hashem, help, 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 help. That's nice. You should do that. We need this help. Ana Hashem Oshiana. Say that. But let the end of your tefillah say, Hashem, I have my bitachon in you. Because then it says, Baputech, Hashem, Chesed, Veshavavenu. If you put your trust in Hashem, then He helps you. We need to put our trust in Hashem at the end. It's going to be okay because we know it's going to be okay. Because we entrust Hashem. By the way, the odds are against us. Let's get one thing. We're in a corner. Ostensibly, this isn't good, but here's the beauty of the Jewish people. Last week, when Hashem told Abraham he's going to have the Jewish people, how did he prove to him the Jewish people? He said, Abraham, go outside and count the stars. How many of you have counted the stars before? Guess what? It's impossible. Do you know what Abraham said? Ah, wow. We're a nation of the impossible. Yalla, let's go and count stars. Hashem says, you got it. Why did he make us that our mother didn't have a womb? Because we do the impossible. Time and time and time again. 100% we're going to win this war. I've been reading some of the Kabbalist comments about the mir- miracle that's going to be happening. Probably right now in Gaza there's miracles. Open your mind to anything can happen. Yes. Who thought that there'll be a hostage just going to be found? And we're going to get in there, just take her out. This is going to give a, a mother a hug. One of the most incredible videos I saw was, was when her mother last week did her prashat khala. The mother of the hostage did the most beautiful hafashat khala. I've never seen such cover now where she cried when she said, Hashem elokeinu. You cry when you say Hashem elokeinu. When you're doing hafashat khala, taking out the good from the bad. Then they, then they got a sefer Torah. They wrote a sefer Torah for her. You think it's a coincidence? They're doing the spiritual work. Spiritual work creates physical ripple effects. My friends, this is the time to feel your Judaism more than any time in your lives. This is it. This is it. This is, this is it. This is, this is it. You're playing the big games now. Time for the big boys. No more like mucking about. It's all about now upping our game. Every morning, how can I up my game? How can I up my game? How can I up my game? Every day I'm saying to myself, the things I'm good at, do more. The things that I'm bad at, deal with it. This is the chance to really fight our Achilles heel. Because in a way, I wish I could be fighting, but I'm fighting in a different way. We've all got to do what we're good at. We've all got to contribute to the war effort in the way we can. And those of you who are with me right now, we can contribute spiritually. We need to contribute spiritually. 
It says in, in Talmud Sanhedrin, page 97, the following. The verse in Isaiah, chapter 60, verse 22, which is a contradiction. Hashem says, I will bring the Shia speedily in its time. Speedily in its time. That's a contradiction. Here we go. My dear friends, if you want to know when this war is going to end, if you want to know what's going to happen, there are two options. Please, God, Hashem, I'm going to start with the good news. We're going to merit it. And we merit it not because we're going to do incredible things on the battlefield. We merit it because we do incredible things on the spiritual field. First and foremost, in our own inner world, we do what Hashem wants. We up our game, whether it be faith, whether it be trust, whether it be prayer, whether it be fill in, whether, whatever it is, kindness, unity, you choose. We do, our, we all know what our demons are. We all know what we're weak at. This is the time to deal with it. If we do teshuva, if we do what we're meant to do, that could just bring it the easy way. And then it will be speedily. It could be quicker. This could end faster. The Talmud in Sanhedrin says there are 6,000 years of the world. That's it. We're now in the year 5784. By the year 6,000, game over. End of this game of chess. So between now and the year 6,000, a lot's got to happen. This war comes to end. We have a third temple. We all live happily ever after. As it says in the book of Daniel and Caria, there'll be resurrection of the dead as well. Everyone comes to live in the utopian world in a beautiful way. Get ready for lots of miracles, guys. It's coming to a beach near you. Super soon. If we do Teshuvah, incredibly quickly. I saw a Kabbalist just last night say, hopefully Pesach. There's a prediction that there was going to be a war between Sukkot and Pesach. And by the way, what we read on Sukkot was about Gog and Magog. I saw the most crazy letter from a Kabbalist called Rav Yonatan Abishit, where he wrote a few hundred years ago that on Simchat Torah was the day that Bilam cursed the Jewish people, that that day to be a terrible day for the Jews. And I couldn't believe what I was seeing. He said, the boys and girls will be dancing through the night. He literally predicted the festival. Amanda Litzman. He saw it. You're going to say, I saw it. I saw the, I saw the letter. Yeah. So this, it's all, it's all been playing out. Amanda Litzman. But we can change. It's up to us. We go one of two directions. We repent. We wake the heck up. We shut our Yetzirah up for once and for all. We say, now, come on. This is the time to work on myself. This is the time for unity. When I asked the Kabbalist next to me, I said, of all the things to tell my community, what's the thing to work on? So much to work on. Is it unity? Is it prayer? Is it faith? I thought it was Emunah and Bitachon. The Chobot Chaim says that's what's needed in the end of the day. He said Shabbat. And it was amazing. I saw a girl called Natalie, an Israeli girl, who was in, in the kibbutz. He was on TV this week, saying she doesn't really understand how it's worked. She was in her house when the terrorists were coming past. And it was just her and her kids. And Natalie looked up to Hashem and said, Hashem, okay, you got me. I'll keep Shabbat now. I'll keep Shabbat. If you get me through this, I'll keep Shabbat. I'll keep Shabbat. I'll keep Shabbat. Keep Shabbat. The terrorist just walked straight past the house like they didn't see it. And she's keeping Shabbat, and she says, I'm so happy I'm alive, and my kids are alive, and I don't understand how it works, but it works. So, you know, if the boys are doing tefillin, you know, just, just up your game on Shabbat, whatever it is. It, I don't know how it works and works. It's called Makar Bracha, the root of all blessing. That's why the Gemara says that the Jewish people all kept one Shabbat, Mashiach has come. I'm telling you now, if of 15 million Jews, I personally think 7.5 million, because there's a law in the Torah where the majority is this everyone, Ruba Kukula. So I think it all it needs is 15.01%. We can get 7.5 million of us keeping Shabbat this week. And by the way, all the soldiers are already keeping it. Because when you're in war, you don't have to keep it. So they're already keeping it. So we've already got, you know, 100,000 maybe. And, and we just need to up, 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 and it'll just light up. Do you know what? For those listening, just try for one day to detox from your phone. 
put your phone away. By the way, it'll be amazing for your mental health. By the way, Shabbat's not all or nothing. Shabbat's, you know, try and just connect to Hashem. A great tzaddik called Ari Levin. It was the rabbi of Jerusalem. One Shabbat, one of his, he was walking outside a synagogue and there was a guy smoking. And he looked at him and said, I know if I tell you to stop smoking, you're going to still smoke. But do me one favor. Putting out the cigarette is a sin called extinguishing. Just leave it. Don't put it out. Don't put it out. By the way, the genius of that, the genius of that rabbi. In other words, every year the Chofetz Chaim said to a similar thing to someone who was smoking 30 a day, just try and smoke 29. Do something for Shabbat. And the story goes that the guy left it out and the following week he kept Shabbat and he stopped smoking and, and, and that one, this one step leads to another step leads to another step. Sometimes you just have to open up your heart to Shabbat. To finish off with, There's a Tehillim, 120. Have a quick look at Tehillim, Kukhaf. Kukhaf. Kukhaf is an amazing Tehillim, King David writes. So much of this is in Tehillim. And by the way, the Tehillim that Rukhaim Bital spoke about is 124. That's a very important Tehillim to say at the time. It says, save me from Adam, which is Terah Adam. And that's where Rukhaim Bital writes. So it says, Psalm 124 is really important. If you go to Psalm 120, you'll see a very interesting word called Kedar. You heard of Kedar? Kedar, if you go to 120 verse 5, Ahalei Kedar. Kedar was one of Ishmael's children. K-E-D-A-R. That's where Muhammad comes from. Kedar. And King David writes the following. All I want is peace with Kedar. Ani shalom! I'm trying, but they just want war. He literally talks about Kedar being, that's where the Ishmael comes from. And you have to understand, we want peace. But if someone wants war, if they want war, they'll give them war. More than that, the Kabbalists say from here, that's how you know the Ishmael, even when they pretend to have peace, don't believe it. King Yasser Arafat famously said, we're not, we're not held by any of the agreements we signed. Because they never really wanted it. It's a joke. It's a joke. As we've now learned about that the DNA, the essence of the certain DNA within certain Ishmael is they hate us, they want to kill us in a wild way. They can't be talked out of it. I want to finish off with this. The way we've got to cry is called a na'aka. It's not enough just to say to Hashem, Hashem help. The mystics say we've got to cry from our from pain. It's almost like a groan. It's like, have you ever had that when you're hungry? You're so hungry it hurts. Now again, what the father who's crying for his hostage to be free, that was a natural scream. We've got to learn to scream. We've got to learn to shout. We've got to then say, Daddy, help me! Hashem, help! We can say that. Don't feel shy to. And, and if you don't want to say it out loud, do it within your in, in your essence. And you have to understand this is intense. Like, this is serious. As I said, it's serious. We can, we can reduce the, the length of this war through our tshuva. That's one thing, na'aka. Second thing is, Rabbi Desta says we've got to kill these smile within us. What does that mean? Let me explain. We'll finish with this. Yishmael and Esau, which is really Gog and Magog. Esau was about arrogance. Esau, the Nazis, probably cultural greatness, but no faith. Yishmael, say the Kabbalists, tremendous faith, no truth. There's a prayer we say on Ma'ariv, Emet the Emunah. The Jewish people, we believe in emunah, the emunah to Hashem, not emunah to my ego, not em- emunah to my lust. You know, the fact that Ishmael says, when we go to heaven, what's our pinnacle of heaven? 72 virgins. 
I've got news for you. You're not even getting 72 granny. 72 nothing. 72 hours of working out you did wrong every 72 hours. And then again, and then again. But it's interesting. That's what they dream of. We don't... Do you know what our ulama ba is? Being with Hashem. Ulama ba is just love and unity and you and Hashem enjoying that oneness, being part of that oneness. That's what we stand for. And therefore, we need to work on our emunah. Work on our emunah on our emet. Let me explain. Yishmael's problem is they come from Abraham who did kindness, but they don't have any limitations to their kindness. It's excessive kindness without boundaries. We've got to work on that within us. You've got to see what is your Achilles heel. Work on that. To finish off with, my, my, one of my mentors, Rabbi Tat, finish off with this midrash, which I'll send you. Listen to the Shiri, this is the big one. You know what's going to happen? Don't need to forget this, because this is a little secret the organ need. How it's going to happen, we don't know, but at a certain point, this is going to happen. There's going to be the leaders of the Arabs and the leaders of the Jews, the leaders of Ishmael and the leaders of the Jews, whoever they are, and they're going to have a discussion. And they're going to say, you've got this temple mount, we both want it. Let's ask Hashem. Let's both go and give a sacrifice. And whoever Hashem sends the fire down, that will be the truth. And whoever wins, you've got to convert to the other. Says the Midrash, we all do that. And we do the sacrifice. And do you know what happens? They win! Yishmael wins! And at that point, Yishmael is going to say to you, New, convert! What would you do? Says the Midrash, we say, Chas Shalom Over my dead body! Never! We say, Shema Yisrael! Adonai Eloheinu! Adonai Echad! Mashiach comes. Rabbi Tatz asked a great subject called Rav Simcha Basman, is that exactly what's going to happen? And he says, exactly, but not like that. Meaning, there'll be this process. Meaning, there'll be a moment of crisis of faith. When that crisis of faith happens, my friends, remember what I'm saying. Hold on to the truth. The truth is, in this book, Hashem promises Abraham, you have a covenant forever! He says, Le'olam. He says in the Torah, you'll never be destroyed. One thing I promise you, Am Yisrael will be here. Hamas won't. One thing I promise you, the third better we thus will be built. How do I know that? The Torah says that everything else has been true, but the last little bits won't be true as well. They'll be true too. So the Chas Hashem, I want to finish off with positivity because that verse in Chizkiyahu meant Martin Ezekiel, he saw the third temple. He saw us. He saw the Jewish people. That's coming very soon. It's really important. Like Rabbi Nachman said, don't be afraid. Every time you have fear, that's a lack of emunah. Let's not have fear. Let's have positivity. Let's be excited for a beautiful future. Let's up our game for our friends. Let's do more faith. Let's do more Shabbat. Let's do more tefillin. Let's do more unity. And the Gaza Shem very, very soon. We should see the, the Pasuk in Sakharia that he prophesizes and say, I can see that one day, you know, coming back to Tel Aviv, it's a bit like a ghost town. It's normally so busy and so bustling. Sakharia says very soon it will be busy again. And very, very soon there'll be a time where there'll be old people. There'll be Yeladim, Yeladot, Nasakim. There'll be young people playing the Gaza Shem very, very soon. We should all merit peace. We should all merit. We see Mashiach come, we should merit, have a world where everyone's united, everyone's at peace, and very, very soon to a world near you. Let's finish off with now a very important Tehillim, which is the one to do with Ishmael. So let's say this together. This is what Rabbi Bital says is referring to what we meant to say with Ishmael. So it's Kuf Chaf Dalit, 124. Here we go. Page 187. Shir Hamalo, the David, the Lab, the Naisha Yalanu, Yamana Israel, the Lab, the Naisha Yalan, the Kum Alane Adam, that's Adam, Pere Adam. As I Chayim, Belone Baharis, Afway Bondu, as I Hamayim Shafunu, 
Nachla Avan Nafsenu, Ave Avan Nafsenu. Hamayim as he's doing in Baruch Adonai, she learns on the term Mishnayim. Nafsenu can support him nothing back against him, back this book. But Nachla in him not, the Adreini Vishayim Adonai, I say, Shamayim Vare. And the final thing, maybe on your phone, just all turn to the Shema. I asked the tablet that I was next to, I said, if you go to a, if you're in a bomb shelter, and you've got one thing to pray for, should you do it with the Hillim? Or should you say the Shema? And he said very much, the Shema is the most powerful thing, especially the first line. So when you say Hashem Echad, Hashem is one, it's really understanding all there is is Hashem. And it's the ultimate pinnacle of, of Emunah. So let's say Shema together. And Biskut the Shema we're going to say together now to bring protection to the Jewish people. Let's go through it together. Shema Yisrael, Adoi Noi Eloi Heinu. Adoi Noi Echad. You have to eat Adoi Noi Eloi Echad. Adoi Noi Echad. Adoi Noi Echad. Adoi Noi Echad. Questions? Anyone got any questions?